now for over 45 years, I've been doing what's called either information security or data security or computer security, cyber, cyber security, identity management, all in my mind, uh, all encompassed in the big sphere of really risk management, which is what we're going to talk about um, today, because every action you take that's related to security is a risk decision. Within a corporation, you know, if you have, um, you know, all of your employees certainly are going to have some form of identity and your customers are going to have a form of identity, making sure that that is appropriately protected so that someone can't um, get access to them without your knowledge. So you want to start with you know, what's really important. Is it your finance? Is it your product development? You know, a small chunk of information that you need to protect, put zero trust around that. And once you have your procedures and tools and automation in place, you can start spreading it to other areas of the company. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our interview with Jeff Rich. Jeff is an executive director at IDSA, which is Identity Defined Security Alliance. And he also is a keynote speaker and board member. And he founded a risk security for Arco, Dell, and other companies. So Jeff, welcome to our Risk Management Show podcast today. Of course, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, it's my pleasure too. So Jeff, I believe that we will have a very thoughtful conversation on the topic of uh, navigating uh, identity theft uh, and the strategies for risk management. But before that, uh, could you please tell us a short story about your career path, what brought you to, you, to where you are right now and what you guys said IDSA uh, up to this day. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Thanks. It, you know, I my career started without getting into all of the details. My degrees in science and physics, I taught in a planetarium for a bit, did some work with law enforcement, and then came over to the commercial public sector side for now for over 45 years. I've been doing what's called either information security or data security or computer security, cyber, cybersecurity, identity management all in my mind, uh, all encompassed in the big sphere of really risk management, which is what we're gonna talk about um, today because every action you take that's related to security is a risk decision. So uh, I'm doing that, as you mentioned, I started the security and risk program at Arco Oil and Gas Company. I started the security program at Dell Computers, at Rackspace Hosting, a few financial services companies. I like um, being able to build those programs, did a few startups, and for the um, past um, little over a year, I've been the executive director for the Identity Defined Security Alliance. And we at IDSA are focused on raising the awareness of identity, identity security, and security. And they all do tie together. And I think we're going to talk about that in, in today's topic. So I enjoy doing this. We have great members at IDSA. That's we're a nonprofit. So that's what makes our organization work. And um, and I love having opportunities to have discussions uh, around this with people like you, of course. Yeah, let's discuss first uh, our topic at hand, and then we will uh, uh, jump back to uh, your event that you will ha you, your uh, organization will uh, uh, organize at uh, on uh, April 9th. So we will discuss it later in this uh, episode. But before that. Okay. Can you tell us, Jeff, what are the most common ways the individuals uh, fail victim to identity theft and how can they recognize uh, if their identity has been compromised? Uh, well, there are certainly some common ways for it to happen. Um, the most likely one is some form of social engineering where someone, um, through measures, either sending a message or even talking or maybe even meeting someone, find a way to compromise the credentials either for you as a victim or for someone who has control over your identity information, therefore giving access to a lot of different victims at one time. And we've seen examples of this recently where some people working in a call center, for instance, um, were a victim of social engineering, their credentials are compromised, and then every one of their customers' credentials are compromised. So I'd say that's the most common well, and, and if you would, the easiest way for that to happen. Um, there are certainly others, you know, having weak passwords and passwords only without multi-factor authentication, that increases your risk uh, for it. And um, within a corporation, you know, if you have, um, you know, all of your employees certainly are going to have some form of identity and your customers are going to have a form of identity. 
making sure that that is appropriately protected so that someone can't um, get access to them without your knowledge. So I'd say those three are there, but without question, if you said, just give me one social engineering wins the day. Yeah, yeah. So nowadays with AI, all this uh, social engineering is uh, just elevating to the next level with all those deep fakes and uh, uh, kind of pro pro almost perfect uh, identity hijacking. Um, yes, that, you know, they can. In fact, there is a, a case um, not too far. It was pretty recent where an individual worked at an organization, not a very large organization, but not necessarily small had never met the the CEO or CFO before in person, knew who they were, and had a Zoom call with that individual who said, we're doing this transaction. I need you to wire this many millions of dollars to this, to this account. And the individual, you know, like most of us would, this is pure social engineering using AI, um, was able to, was convinced to say, well, this must be accurate because it looks like the picture I've seen of him. And he's asking a reason, you know, the right request. So the money was wired. Of course, the money was lost because it was a deep fit. Mm -hmm. And as much as we all like to think, oh, that would never happen to me. That just means you just haven't had a bad day yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I know some uh, uh, big cases of this identity theft. Also, small, small levels like individuals uh, um, losing access to their... Uh, uh, social uh, uh, social networks, and then suddenly something uh, uh, their families uh, member receiving members of help or something send them money <laughs> from, uh, and also uh, yeah, as, as as you mentioned, the, we call it uh, um, CEO uh, kind of uh, fraud because some somebody pretended to be a CEO or C CFO asking to. To wire some uh, some stuff by uh, or efficient uh, email or by deep fakes, so we have some cases also in the Netherlands uh, here. Okay, but uh, um, Jeff, could could uh, could you explain the concept of identity theft uh, risk management and how how can this be kind of institutionalized in the uh, in the in the company in the organization? So I, I think looking at identity theft and identity security, and I'd rather take the positive view of identity security is a much better mechanism to follow than identity theft. Um, it, it really boils down to some of the basic risk management principles that are out there. And I'll, I'll start with one, compartmentalization. Now, compartmentalization exists, especially in government and military organizations, because you want to make sure that no one person has access to everything at once. So you give part of the knowledge, part of the knowledge to one group or one individual and another part of the knowledge to another so that they have to be able to collaborate, work together or cooperate, depending on uh, whether the intent is good or not in order to accomplish what they need to do. So take that method of compartmentalization and apply it to your identities. And uh, I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with a consumer view, but then I want to get to a corporate view as well. And, and I promise this won't take long. It sounded like I just mm -hmm. laying out a lot, but I'm not. From a consumer perspective, I have hundreds, I, I'm an approaching thousand um, different identities in different systems. And I have a credential manager to keep all of those. Now I compartmentalize those as in the account and information I use to access my bank is mm -hmm. very different from the account and information I use to access social media. I'll use those two as examples, which, so if I'm going on X or LinkedIn, I'm going to use different accounts and different credentials than I use with my bank mm -hmm. or with my doctor, because I look at those two as high risk. I, there's many reasons why I don't want that information that my identity to be compromised, either because I'm going to lose money or my health information is going to be compromised and, and you can't undo that. So with those high risk ones, I keep the number of those accounts small, a unique one for each, and I keep them secure and I change how I get in there routinely. So even if someone can figure out what they are or sees what they are, they're, going, they're not going to see how I use them routinely because I'm going to change how I use them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that keeps those most more secure. Now, what I do with social media, in some cases, I'll change the password once a year uh, only because not that I'm don't not that I don't care about it, 
but my risk of having that compromise is lower. And even if someone does compromise one of my social media accounts, they're not going to very likely not going to be able to get to use any of those credentials in banking or healthcare or anything else I do that's high risk. So take that approach and put it in the corporate sector now. And and although I'm I'm going to end up using the buzzword zero trust, and, and it's more yeah. than a buzzword, it, it is a good framework. It's not for everyone, and it's not always easy to implement depending on what you're doing. But this is how zero trust has to be started because it starts with identity. That's the first pillar of zero trust. And if I have access to the corporate um, internal finances and access to the um, R&D function that says, here's the products we're developing for next year or in, for the next three years, and here's our marketing strategy, those are all very important to me as a corporation. I don't want any of that compromise. So I may even have a unique account, but I'm certainly going to have a compartmentalized space for me to get into it that's more secure. And what I do for email or maybe social corporate social media is going to be a much lower risk. So I'm not as concerned about having to keep that unique, having to keep it secret or separate or having to be more secure with it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the zero trust makes uh, kind of you have to do it all over again, like uh, uh, like uh, Groundhog Day. Yeah? You you don't have a constant uh, password, or you will get assigned a new password or something like this. Well, uh, that could be one way of doing it. I haven't heard of Groundhog Day yet analogy yet, but but I can see how it could work. But zero trust, when done effectively, simply means you have mechanisms in place that once you've authenticated yourself and determined that you have access to do what you do. You conduct your transaction, and then that memory goes away. Mm -hmm. And even if you need to do the same transaction again, you go through a similar identification and authentication, but it may actually be different. Different. You could know it works, which could make it even more secure. But the key to zero trust is assume when anything's going to happen that I don't know who you are, I don't know if you're supposed to be able to do this, and you need to prove all that to me. And that's why, by the way, some zero trust programs end up failing because I've seen some organizations that say, we want to do zero trust everywhere. Take a look, listen to what we just described. If you had to do that with everything you did at work, you, you wouldn't get anything done. So you want to start with you know, what's really important. Is it your finance? Is it your product development? You know, a small chunk of information that you need to protect, put zero trust around that. And once you have your procedures and tools and automation in place, you can start spreading it to other areas of it. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, can you discuss the role of uh, employee training and awareness programs uh, in fostering the culture of uh, security within organization? Uh, probably your organization is doing this and maybe we can discuss more deeper uh, about your event that is going to be uh, online event uh, on uh, next, uh, next, uh, within next month. Uh, yes. <clears throat> so, I, you know, I've developed security awareness programs at a number of companies where I've worked. And, and and this is going to sound like, gee, this is a security professional who's been doing this 50 years. Why is he saying this? I am not a strong believer in security awareness. And let me explain why. Security awareness, unfortunately, many times takes the persona of once a year, you look at a 20-minute video and you take a 10-question quiz. And if you pass it, you've, you've met your security awareness um, responsibilities for the year and you don't have to do it again for another year. Although there is some goodness in that, the, the problem I have with that is two months after that, people probably forgot what was in that video, forgot what the answers were in the quiz, and they haven't necessarily gained much. So rather than only security awareness, I think security engagement is, is really has more value, where on a weekly or daily basis, um, you just offer a tidbit. I, at one organization I worked, I call them security snippets, where you just offer a tidbit. Here's one concept. Here, phishing. Let's talk about phishing, and we spend no more than three minutes on it. Here's what phishing is. Here's how it will look to you, and here's how you can help prevent it. And then by doing that, and, and at this organization, I did those snippets once a week. What that generated was an awareness for all of the employees to say, oh, this is something that I can actually learn of. This one may not interest me, but this one does. And it generates questions back to the security team 
saying, hey, I'm seeing this, is this fishing? And I'd always rather get that question, even if the answer is no, it's not fishing, you're good. I'd rather have that than, oh, gee, I didn't think it was fishing, so I never did anything about it. I mean, that's not the situation you ever want to be in. So by offering, you know, drops or snippets or um, routine information going to everyone that becomes part of their daily routine, I think security engagement gives you a lot more value than security training. And I've seen the positive effects of that. Um, doing that correctly means that now you have your front line of defense is, is no longer your firewalls, it's your employees. Mm -hmm. And that's how you want an organization work. You want the people to know what it is they should be looking for, be on the lookout for it and protect against it. Now you mentioned identity management day and I'm not gonna pass up the opportunity to talk about it a bit. Um, this is an annual event. This is the fourth year that um, IDSA has hosted identity management day. And we do that in um, collaboration with our, with our um, host, um, the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And those are the people that are responsible for um, uh, Security Awareness Month in October and um, and see something, say something, stay safe online. So good people to work with. This year, it's going to be on April 9th. And last year, we had um, almost 1,200 participants online and representing 93 different countries, which really surprised us, actually, wow. um, in a good way. So that led us to, to think this year, you know, if so many countries are involved, let's make this an around-the-world event. So this is going to be a 21-hour conference online. Starting at midnight UTC, I'll let you translate what that means to where you are. And that'll be launching in Melbourne, Australia. There'll be about six hours of events and sessions. There'll be a quick intermission. And then we're gonna go to about five hours of events in um, Europe, Middle East and, and uh, Africa. That's coming out of Paris. Um, the one in Australia is hosted by Identity XP. In Paris, it's hosted by the Secure Identity Alliance. And then there'll be another 30 minute intermission. And then we launch in the Americas. And, um, and IDSA will be hosting that one in particular. And with IDSA, um, in rather with the Americas, we have some sponsors. We have not only great sessions, a fantastic keynote talking about AI and identity, you know, something that you brought up already um, with a fantastic speaker, Caleb Seema. And we're gonna have exhibit booths. There's gamification. If you go to the booth and interact with people and go to sessions, you'll get points. And whoever has the most points at the end goes into a, a, a raffle drawing for some really good prizes. So mm -hmm. all of that wrapped up in a free event that you can access by going to identitymanagementday.org. Yeah, we will provide the link to this uh, to this event at uh, show notes. So yeah, we have about uh, uh, five minutes. Maybe we can uh, continue some uh, important question. So Jeff, in the event of identity theft, what immediate steps uh, should someone take to mitigate the damage and begin the process of restoring their identity? So it, it, it's going to depend on what was stolen, obviously. Um, but I, I think in general, the first step you should take is attempt to disable whatever you think is compromised and reset it for yourself so that you know now you can get to it and, and chances are no one else can. Without question, you need to notify if this was an identity that's being managed by, say, your bank or your company. Notify whoever is managing that and say, hey, my identity has been compromised. You need to secure it or maybe even give me a new one. That's what um, things that need to be done to reduce risk. And then the next thing I'd recommend is go to your credit reporting bureaus. Um, in the U.S. in particular is how this works and notify them that you believe your identity has been stolen. Now that can do a couple of things. You'll, you'll, you'll be given the option to freeze your, your credit account so that no one can open a new account on your in your name. I'd recommend doing that now. That's a very good preventive technique because you don't want to find out someone opened a new loan in your name, took out a $100,000 loan in your name. What you'd rather do is find out someone's attempting to do it, but it was blocked because you put a freeze on your accounts and now you know about it. But Certainly, if you didn't do it before, do it after. And then if you didn't have an inventory of what that identity did and what it had access to, that's the time you're going to need to build it. So here's another lesson. Do that now. You should know what you could do with each account before it gets compromised. And I say that because chances are something, one of your accounts or multiple accounts will be compromised. 
it's the way of the world right now. And until we have better, unique, uh, better um, ubiquitous protection for it, it's very likely going to happen to you. So take that inventory. And that gives you the opportunity to start categorizing for that compartmentalization. Here's my high risk. Here's my medium risk. Here's my low risk accounts. Doing that in front can save you a lot of work when a compromise does happen. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. And I would like to ask you a personal point of view. What are the major misconceptions in the field of identity, yeah, safe, safe or protection that you strongly disagree with? Um, so it, it, I, you broke up a bit. I, I, I heard that there was a misconception about protection and I disagree with something, which is probably true, but I didn't hear what it was. I'm sorry. No, I, in, the, in the area of uh, identity protection, identity theft, this is area that you kind of misconception that you disagree with. Oh, so, all right, no, now I got it. Thank you. So um, I think the um, everyone's spying on you all the time. I think that's a misconception, even though it can be true, um, you're not necessarily that big a target. Chances are when you or your company gets hit with identity theft, it's because very likely it was a shotgun blast and you happened to be in, in the debris field rather than you were always targeted. Now, there are cases where it is targeted and to use a, without uh, getting into depth, a very recent case um, with um, Change Healthcare, which is a clearinghouse owned by United Healthcare. And by the way, I'm not picking on them because this can happen and will happen to many organizations. Um, they do um, pre-authorization for surgeries. They um, issue um, clearances for whether something's gonna be covered by insurance or not. They issue authorization for providers to get paid. There was a ransomware attack that, that really disabled them. Mm -hmm. And now there's actually a lot of small healthcare providers that are going for an extended period of time without getting paid for anything, any of the services. And that means that their existence is now in jeopardy. So um, the they are being targeted. So if you're in a if you're in an industry that is being targeted, whether it's financial services or healthcare, are probably the top two. Government is certainly up there as well. All the others, you're very likely collateral damage as opposed to the specific specific target. So don't think they're going right after you. So I think that is a misconception. You need to protect yourself regardless because you will become collateral damage. Um, the All second right. thing is, I'm not important. Why would they go after me? Your information is already on the dark web. I promise you. I, and I'm not here to do to gamble with you, but anyone can offer me a bet to say my information is not on the dark web. I'll take that bet and I'll win. So your information is already out there. Act appropriately. Know that the information is there and do things to whether it's simple as changing your password, using multi-factor authentication, using um, pass keys, whatever tools are available for you, use them because your information is already out there. Yeah, fantastic. I, I, I uh, uh, certainly uh, recognize uh, some of the uh, uh, mentions that you, you did uh, regarding the, our data in the, is in the dark web because I, I got sometimes uh, I get sometimes uh, strange uh, um, telephone calls. Somebody from kind of my broker wants to do something. <laughs> and I already know that uh, it's not uh, it's not about uh, good good uh, good uh, intentions. So I just uh, hang out uh, with them. So let's uh, no, just, wait, just... There, there is an excellent defense for that too. Whenever your bank or broker or whoever calls you and says, "Oh, here's you know, we need your re reset your password. Tell us what it is, or we you know we need to transfer money." Just say, "Thank you. Give me your name. I'm going to call the number that I know exists for my broker, and I'm going to ask for you." Let them yeah. hang up. You won't have to hang up when you do that. Ah, uh, okay. Good, good tip. Yeah, thank you. Next time. <laughs> All right. So, Jeff, if we summarize our interview for someone who is listening to this and would like to walk away with one or two major uh, uh, takeaways, what would that be? Um, so, first of all, you can get some free resources. We're a nonprofit, and, that, and that's why, at idsalliance.org. So feel free to come download our reports, look at our white papers and, and, and such, or, or consider joining if you like. But I, I think the takeaways, whether you're an enterprise or an individual, are first of all, think about your identity footprint because identity sprawl exists. You have accounts in more places than you think about. If you sat down to write them all down, 
you you would know that there were more than you thought. Identify that, categorize them to high risk, medium risk, low risk. Act accordingly, really protect the high risk. That's where you need to put your effort. So that's number one. If you're only using a password to get to something, see if your provider can offer something else, whether it's a, a, a USB key, a pass key, um, multi-factor authentication with something that's pushed to an app on your phone, whatever you can use to say, give me something in addition to a password, use it. And consider using a password manager where you need to use passwords because you're not, now once you do everything I recommended, you're probably not gonna remember all of them. And I know people like to write them down. In fact, we have a session at Identity Management Day about how people love password notebooks. Please don't do that. <laughs> Get a password <laughs> manager. That's what they're designed for. They do their job really well. Yeah, I know. Uh, the the most uh, uh, difficult that, uh, because now we have so many systems, so it makes a lot of uh, mental uh, kind of stress to kind of summarize and systematize all these changes and what you need to do in every system, you know? Yeah, even if you have a great memory, you're not going to remember all of them. So, so get a good password manager. And, and the good ones can work on your phone and on your computer. So you, you never have to worry about, it, are you going to miss it? And you can keep an offline vault copy as well, which I do, so that should something happen to that password manager um, service, I can always still, I know where things are and I can go and reset them as well. But uh, number one, be aware of what you have access to and what type of access and manage that appropriately. All right, fantastic, Jen. Jeff, uh, that was all my were all my questions. So I I wish you a successful uh, um, event uh, uh, next. Uh, what was it? April 9th. and uh, I, I invite all our listeners and uh, viewers to visit this event, and we will provide also link. You will check a uh, please check in the description uh, all the link to this event. So I hope we will uh, we will continue our relationship with you and your organization. And uh, you will be, you can, you're, you're free to post anything on globalriskcommunity.com where, where, where we have a lot of uh, risk managers and uh, people who are interested in what you do. Great. Thank you, Boris. It's been a, it's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to seeing everyone at Identity Management Day. And, and as you said, continuing our relationship and uh, posting information there and having another good conversation in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye.